Hey everyone, Dr. Jess, and I'm filming from the beautiful location of Hawaii today for you guys. Um, but I'd actually planned this video on mold and mycotoxin illness and how to take care of your home and look for mold recently. And the irony of this story is that when we came to Hawaii, our hotel room had mold. And again, I was reminded about how serious this condition is, um, especially since my boyfriend is genetically susceptible. So that even propelled me more so into wanting to make this video for you guys to educate you guys since this is something that most doctors and patients don't know about and aren't educated on. So it flies under the radar for most people and it is a root cause of so many different illnesses and chronic disease. So I have to talk about it with you guys. I've even prepared a little check list here because today we're gonna to do frequently asked questions about mold and um, after listening to you guys so much about questions and how to fix things and what to do next I really thought this would be a powerful video to help empower you guys um, to take your own health back and to ask doctors the, rele the relevant questions that you need asked so um, number one what are symptoms of mold um, and here I want to differentiate between a mold allergy and a mold toxicity so in general, mold is behind asthma and allergies, especially in many children. Um, so that's something to be investigated if your child suffers from asthma. Um, general mold allergy symptoms are things like red, itchy, watery eyes, sneezing, coughing, sinus drainage. You may even have, um, you may even get uh, sinus infections that are recurrent or other problems like that. So that can be a recurrent mold allergy if you keep being exposed. A mold toxicity is caused by the release of mycotoxins and there are genetically susceptible people that we'll talk about later. And that's very different. That can present even as autoimmunity. It can present as chronic fatigue. It can present as joint and muscle pains. So there is a difference between mold allergy and mold toxicity or mycotoxin illness. And that's what I want to differentiate between the two. I myself am not genetically susceptible, so I get itchy, watery eyes, and allergy-like symptoms. However, my boyfriend gets depressed, anxious, and really has physical pain symptoms because he has a genetic haplotype or genetic predisposition um, to feeling mycotoxin illness. So number two, is mold toxic to everyone? I think I kind of answered that question. Um, mold produces mycotoxins, which are volatile organic compounds or VOCs. VOCs are actually made in biological and chemical warfare and are extremely toxic to the body. Um, there's a type of mold called mycophenolic acid that is black mold. And mycophenolate is a medicine that comes from the mold mycophenolic acid. Mycophenolate is an immunosuppressive drug. It's given to patients who have, let's say, a kidney transplant or some sort of organ transplant, and their body, sh we don't want them to reject that organ. Mycophenolate is a medicine we give to have the patient not reject that organ. So that's how immunosuppressive mold is, is it's actually a medication to immunosuppress people when we don't want their transplant to be rejected. So yes, mold is essentially toxic to everyone. However, in a very toxic world that we live in with toxic household products and chemical exposures, mold can get a leg up on many people because their immune systems are already run down. So we really wanna be aware of mold because it is a root cause of so many chronic disorders, as I mentioned earlier. Okay, where are hidden sources of exposure? So this is a great question because people think, oh, I haven't seen a leak in my house or there are, there's no visible water damage so I'm out of the woods. That's not exactly true. We think up to 50 to 75% of houses have current water damage and up to 85% have had some sort of past damage with remediation thereafter. So it's a big problem. And if you guys think about how houses are built, they're built exposed to the elements, right? So it rains on that wood. The wood is brought in wet. And does that ever dry? You know, no. Really the answer is something like prefabricated houses or houses built, still houses that are built covered and away from the elements. However, you still have to watch where you place that house because groundwater and environment can still be a problem. Um, other than that, in your house, if you're already there, you're in an apartment, you're in a house, and you wanna know if it's a problem, you really wanna look at water uh, windows. Is water able to leak in into sills and cause problems? Do you see black mold visible on a window sill? Um, also things like chimney 
chimneys can have leaks, crawl spaces, um, any sort of baseboards. Um, if you've ever had, let's say, a toilet overflow or any sort of leak, that mold can grow in 24 to 48 hours. So you want to make sure that any sort of leaks or spills are cleaned up within that time because even slight water damage can grow mold in as little as 24 hours and that can really affect susceptible people. So there's a lot of places to different look. Uh, another place, front loading washers. Um, I have one of these and we leave the door open every time we do laundry because close it and you get a ring of mold around the center um, rim of that front loading washer. And so that's not a great thing for many people either. I have found a new invention that sits on top of the washer and turns the water into hydrogen peroxide or H2O2, which run the water through the machine and turn it to hydrogen peroxide, which scrubs some of these porous materials that can hold mold spores clean. However, it doesn't do as well with soiled laundry. So keep that in mind if you're looking into them. I just ordered one and I'll keep you guys posted about my reviews and honesty on that product. Any other sources, also AC units and HVACs. This is a really scary source because once mold spores are in that AC unit or the HVAC, they can actually push them out into the environment. So this is something to really watch out for. Um, if you guys suspect a moldy house, look in the, the AC units, the HVACs. Really important to investigate that. Um, and if you do work on houses or around some toxic chemicals like that, you are at higher risk of mold exposure. So please be weary. All right. Oh, one more thing, guys. Also, if you do, if you are worried about mold and you live in a very humid environment, dark, cold, humid places where where mold likes. So please try to keep your hum humidity below 50%. That's an, it's sort of a safeguard against mold. Um, you also can get mold readers or water readers, which can tell if there's been water damage in the house and read that area of the house to let you know if it's safe or not. All right. Number four. Um, how do we get rid of mold indoors? So this is a really tough question. Um, a lot of my job sometimes has me as a doc telling patients, you know, you really need to spend thousands of dollars to remediate your home. I can't get you better until you're out of the exposure, which is absolutely true. And it's daunting to people because they spent thousands of dollars on their dwelling and where they live. And then here I am as a doctor telling them to move out of their home when there's really not a lot of scientific evidence about how mold affects us. So this is difficult. Um, people really don't think about sick building syndrome. They really don't think about about how our environment makes us sick, it's not our bodies, because we aren't taught that. So um, it really flies under the radar for many people. And once you learn that you may have mold toxicity, um, you need to find out where it's coming from because you can't heal unless you're out of the exposure. So don't just pick up those metal plates that you sit around the house. They often miss mold and are inaccurate. So you don't wanna get the metal plates. What I recommend is an ERMI test, which stands for Environmental Relative Moldy Index. And it's a test created by the Environmental Protection Agency or EPA and this is uses DNA to detect mold um, or mycotoxins which is more accurate um, and you can actually get one from myometrics.com and that is an ERMI approved test which will go through using physical or or um, samples that you swipe through the air to pick up the mold spores um, it's if you get all the different samples that they include in the test you'll probably spend three to four hundred dollars which is significantly lower than getting someone to come out and test your house which may or may not be me approved and I have myself have heard hundreds of stories of people who've spent thousands of dollars have mold experts come out to their house knowing there's tons of visible mold there and the test is still negative so please do your due diligence and look for an ERMI approved test so that way you guys aren't paying double and you can trust the results of a test it's often nice to test yourself and see what species of mold comes up and then double kind of confirm it with an ERMI test in the house to ensure that that's the place you got the exposure, right? So hope that helps you guys. That way you can save some money. Um, okay, so how do you diagnose it, right? Who's susceptible? So one out of four people, and that's about 25% of the population, guys, has a genetic haplotype, usually DQ8 or DR, which make them susceptible to things like celiac disease or mycotoxin illness or SIRS, chronic inflammatory response syndrome, which is a systemic attack on the body from mycotoxin illness, which wipes out the HPA or um, adrenal axis. It also um, causes low testosterone. It can cause an estrogen dominance. People feel wired but tired, exhausted. They have neurologic effects like brain fog, 
Um, and it really can be serious systemic effect, even causing autoimmunity and cancer in some people if undetected. New studies have um, alluded to the fact that mycotoxin illness, if left unchecked, is the cause of inhalation or type 3 Alzheimer's disease. So we really want to pay close attention to these patients and where the root cause is coming from. And if you guys know me, I believe it comes from four places alone that changed your genes, your grandparents' genes, your parents' genes along the way, and that's um, hidden infections like mold or Lyme. Emotional trauma or stress that can be passed down from generations, uh, heavy metals like mercury or lead, aluminum, or environmental toxicities such as BPA or pesticides, which are a huge one. Um, so when you mix all these environmental toxicities together, you really have people who can be very susceptible based on their genotype as well as not being able to detoxify the other um, heavy metals or toxicities out in the environment, which put them kind of at a disadvantage. Uh, so with diagnosis, you really want to look at the HL HLA genetic types. You want to test the blood to see um, who's susceptible and who isn't. On top of that, um, we can now diagnose people People through the urine and we do that through DNA so it's very accurate you can detect urine mycotoxins um, there are also some serum or systemic blood um, markers that can be used if the um, mold has turned systemic and is affecting the hormonal and immune systems at that time things like uh, TGF beta things like MMP9 things like melanocyte stimulating hormone or MSH um, C3A and some of the complement factors are very useful in determining whether uh, mold has a affected the entire systemic uh, system at this point and caused some um, disarray in homeostasis. So that's how you can test the Great Plains Laboratory test at greatplainslaboratory.com. The mycotoxin test is one of my favorites. Vib Vibrant Labs also has one and these run usually around two to three hundred dollars uh, for a pretty accurate test. The serum markers are a bit more expensive but a lot of times if you get a good thorough history and you have an exposure to a water damaged building on top of the mycotoxin test you don't need anymore. And again, one out of four people has a genetic susceptibility, which makes them susceptible to mycotoxin illness or SIRS, chronic inflammatory response syndrome, and not just mold allergies. So really people can get very sick from this. All right, guys, now what you've been waiting for. So treatment, what do we do for treatment? Um, and, and how do we help people heal from this? Because it's sort of likened to mold, or excuse me, likened to Lyme for me. This is a war for many, many people. And if your detox pathways aren't open, it's not appropriate to get you on binders and other supplements. We need to make sure that you have appropriate liver support, that your liver pathways are open, your phase one, phase two detox pathways are open. We need to make sure that you're sweating. Do you not sweat? That's a sign that there's a hidden infection that's blocked some pathways for you. And you could trigger your body to start sweating again um, through daily interaction and infrared sauna or some sort of workout if your body can tolerate it. Um, even 10 minutes a day can eventually trigger your body to start sweating again. And remember that skin is the biggest detox organ. So it's really important to be able to sweat. And if you don't, you'll be holding those toxins in your body, just like if you don't poop twice a day, right? That's really important too, guys. Everyone thinks talking about poop is taboo, but if you don't poop, you're holding all those toxins in, just like if you don't sweat. So it's very very important for you guys to make sure your detox pathways are open before you start killing things like mold or binding them up you know do you poop twice a day these are the checklists so do you poop twice a day um, are you seeing undigested food in your stool hopefully not if you are then we need to work on your absorption and your bile movement um, do you sweat you know, if you guys can say yes to most of those questions, then you're ready to start killing and binding. And as you guys know, my trademark protocol is kill, bind, sweat. And so for that protocol, you wanna take something that is a natural uh, killer, something like um, Microbiomaster or Biocidin, um, some lovely things like oregano leaf or um, organ grapefruit, berberine, uh, wormwood, black walnut hull, garlic, reishi. There's some amazing um, anti-herbal supplements and um, just herbs out there that are beautiful in helping to treat the secondary conditions like candida that come with mycotoxin illness. On top of that, you guys may also want to add in things like NAC, N-acetylcysteine, which is a precursor to glutathione, the master antioxidant in the body. Some people have genetic mutations where they can't handle glutathione exogenously. So if that's the case, NAC also converts over to glutathione, and that is a biofilm buster. I also really like fibrinolytic enzymes, things like serapeptase, things like protease, things like... Uh, 
natokinase, which help to thin the blood and decrease inflammation during the time of detox. Omega-3s are also really, really important for this. And you know, great liver support. So milk thistle, glycine, methionine, some of those nice amino acids to help with liver support are super helpful. Um, on to binders. Once you are find the um, biofilm busters, the killer part of the treatment, then you want to move on to binders, which are probably arguably the most important part of mycotoxin illness treatment. And that's because the binders um, are actually what pulls things from the tissues, the bones, where a lot of these hidden infections like Lyme and mold like to fester and hide away from the body's defenses. They like the mucous membranes, the joint fluid, uh, the lymph, right? All these are super important for mycotoxins um, and to be able to hide from the body's defenses. So you guys need to run them out, right? And pull them out. And that's what binders do. Things like activated charcoal, zeolite clay, silica, apple pectin, and humic and fulvic acid, which have been shown to decrease glyphosate in the body or Roundup Ready by Monsanto. So you guys, this is really important. So binders are a great way to pull things from the body and detox. But then once they're bound up, you must remove them from the body. That's what's really important to be pooping and sweating. Otherwise you're holding those bound toxins up in the body. So the worst thing to do is give your, uh, friend a binder if they're not using the bathroom regularly. That's a really cool thing to do, so make sure people's detox pathways are open. Binder Master will be coming soon and has all the top ingredients as a medical grade master binder. So um, coming soon, guys. Um, last but not least, you also want to look at liposomal vitamin C, um, L-carnitine, phosphatidylcholine, coenzyme Q10, probiotics, bitters, enzymes, um, and then add in ozone if needed, right? So ozone is another kill part of the treatment, so you must be sure your detox pathways are open. All this added in with a tailored regimen looked over by a healthcare practitioner that you trust. So what I wanna do now is, since we've gone over the frequently asked questions, um, hopefully this makes a lot of sense to you guys. Now I'll just kind of uh, put everything together in a checklist for you guys so you understand what to do next and where to go next. So first and foremost, if you have things like brain fog, joint pains, um, depersonalization, static shocks on the skin at night, difficulty holding urine, weight loss, weight gain, inflammation, um, decreased libido or sex drive, um, all these things can indicate a hidden infection. So be sure to get find a doctor you trust and get tested first and foremost. But ways to prevent this, right, if you're worried about mycotoxin illness or hidden infections, always keep the humidity in your dwelling or house less than 50%. This is sort of um, a guarantee that mycotoxins will not be able to grow there. A further great guarantee is that you're aware of any leaks or water damage to please get out of the exposure immediately at all costs and to have it remediated within 24 to 48 hours. Even slight dampness can predispose to mold growth. You want to re-inspect re any sort of remediation, caulking areas in the window that might be leaking, um, bathrooms, windows, carpets, anything porous that can hold mycotoxins. And also, you know, porous materials in general. People ask me, you know, once I have um, I've been remediated and healed from mold, do I have to throw all my things away? And the answer is it depends on your genes and your susceptibility and how you react. But for the most part, I say yes to porous things, things like couches, things like, you know, curtains, carpet, um, many clothes will have to be thrown out unless you guys can see, um, can get something to run hydrogen peroxide through your washer to clean your clothes. Otherwise, I would get rid of most porous furniture and things if you're extremely sensitive. So that's sort of a checklist with that. Um, also, minimize toxic exposure to um, exposures to other household products or, um, you know, different pesticides, um, the standard American diet. These will really over overload the liver, which is already taxed if you have mycotoxin illness. Um, and so you really want your detox organs working at peak performance and avoiding things which can clog them along the way will help you out while you're detoxing from mycotoxin illness. And then most of you guys know the rest of it. You know, for sure take supplements that I've already recommended. Although they're not the magic bullet, um, all this together is the magic bullet. So supplements are a part of that game plan during this. Most people do need help, even if it's just from one to four months with mycotoxin illness. And it's hard to give a sort of game plan about when everyone will be healed from this disease because everyone's different and their genes are different. Um, for most people, if they get out of the exposure, people can heal within a month or two. If you're genetically predisposed, it may take anywhere 
from four to six months to up to a year to really heal some of the damage that has been done if it's a long-term insidious infection. So be patient with yourself. As long as it took you to get sick, it may take you that long to heal, but have faith that when given the right recipe, your body can. Last but not least, you guys really want to kill buying sweat almost every day. If you're not micronutrient deficient, you're being overseen by a doctor, it's really good to get in the infrared sauna or go to hot yoga class or really sweat and utilize that detox pathway with a binder um, almost every day for until you're healed at least. And you can actually do a temperature check and you know, back off of it after a couple months. If you regress in symptoms, it means you were not all the way there yet. And please guys, over, be overseen by a healthcare practitioner when you are detoxing because everyone's different and it sometimes needs a tailored uh, detox plan for everyone who's involved. Last but not least, the patients who do the best in my practice and with me are the patients who are researched um, and read up on their own and care about their health. So you are your own best doctor. No one is gonna research an evidence-based medicine like you are when you have something wrong. You are your best healer, you are your best champion, you are your best cheerleader. So always trust yourself and educate yourself because trust me, you patients know more than the doctors many, many times. And so really you do yourself a justice at, or a service, excuse me, you do yourself a service and do justice for everyone else when you uh, do your research. So guys, I hope this helps. I hope the checklist helped. Uh, please look forward to more mold remediation tips as we go along. As, as I learn more, I will continue to share. Thanks for watching guys from Hawaii.